Hi everyone, we are back here with a feedback session by Catherine Chaninova in response to the workshop we had on the first day of the conference. So to continue the session we had actually during the workshop itself, Catherine, can you please elaborate on the question that was related to building the roadmap in the agile software development environment, if I remember it correctly? Yes, sure. So, um, let's repeat one of the bases that the product roadmap, uh, it consists of a global initiative and all of its planned steps. So, it has to be sure to update the roadmap of the product throughout its whole entire life cycle. The roadmap, they differ in different teams, obviously. Some people prefer to stick to agile uh, systems, some people prefer to stick to waterfalls. Now, uh, we have to know exactly the differences between the Agile and Waterfall. So the most important part is that uh, Waterfall teams, they're usually business-oriented and they're based on financial metrics. When Agile, they are more customer-oriented and have well customer-oriented goals like uh, user growth or customer satisfaction. Now, the Waterfall Roadmap, they show a completion of the project in about a year or two when Agile Roadmaps, they typically uh, based on a quarterly completions. And the difference also related to the principle of the interaction. The interactions in the waterfall, they are consistent. And the members of the Agile team, they work in accordance with the cross-functionality and the simultaneous actions. Also, uh, there is a huge difference between the waterfall and Agile roadmaps in case of flexibility. The waterfall roadmaps, they have a very limited flexibility when Agile, they are much more flexible, just like the methodology itself. And this whole ability to take a step back and conduct the research before making a pivotal decision is a hallmark of the whole Agile roadmap. Now, it allows the team to develop uh, product capabilities as they receive new information about the product itself and the market. Instead of trying to predict several years of new information and, well, they're just not going ahead with product features, they're thinking about how it should be developed. And this is why Agile managers, uh, they're regularly updating the product roadmap based on the emerging market and the opportunities of, and the customer feedback. But again, uh, just like any other system, just like any other roadmap, uh, Agile roadmaps also have different uh, risks. The main three risks that you have to have always in mind is that if the roadmap changes way too frequently, the team may lose faith in the mere fact that the management is actually capable of making strategic decisions. And at the same time, if the roadmap is not updated frequently enough, the product may enter the market too late and not meet the accumulated demands. So these two main things, there is a very thin line about uh, how often you make the changes to the roadmap. But you have to be right on point so you catch the precise uh, number of changes that are needed. Uh, now, the third risk that there is with the Agile map is that the long-term tasks, they might seem cumbersome for small iterations. So to compensate for this, the team sometimes begins to split the task into small pieces. And as a result, they focus too much on the short-term results instead of uh, the quarterly ones. So when we're talking about, in general, the application of the Agile system for roadmaps and software development is basically just any other roadmap as, as you would use for Agile. You just have to divide your small milestones by quarters and to do the revision of every single step once you hit every milestone. It's okay to take some time to step back and actually think about what you're doing but you have to make sure that uh, this decision is actually going to help you to enter the market. It's not going to set you back a couple of months behind on what you do. And try not to make the tasks way too big because unless you want to have your team separating them in small pieces that might be risky, you should be very sure that what we're doing right now, you're capable of doing it. Now, for example, um, there are actually some of the... Um, applications while well, there are actually some of the roadmaps that I do like and I'd like to share with uh, with you guys. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. 
I'm not sure if you can see it. Not yet. Okay, so we're just waiting for Pine to. Okay, we'll just see if Pine will uh, help us out here. Did you allow all the permissions? Uh, yeah, I can okay. see. Cool. So uh, there are some tools that we can use to build the roadmap. Uh, the most known ones are Miro and also there is a uh, Roadmonk that I love a lot. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the example of the successful Agile map based on our company because it's all under NDA, but there are some templates that we can use. So for example, here, uh, this is a, a very good and clear example of an Agile roadmap that is divided by the quarter. So we have uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, one year, and then there is a next year. So we have the team separated by different tasks and divisions that they, they, that they do. So we have front end, back end, uh, UX and design, marketing and blah, blah, blah. So uh, all of them have their own tasks during some time. So when they're hitting the exact milestone, like it's all here, unless it's like overlapping to the next quarter, it just stops in the, in the certain quarter. So uh, this is basically how you should make sure that your roadmap will look like if you want to uh, move forward with the agile view. Uh, this is one of the simplest examples that, that exists. So basically just here we have every single person uh, or every, every single person's a responsibility in the project, like who is responsible for uh, the frames and I don't know, well, link sharing in the back end, who is responsible for marketing, like for which part of it. So this is more or less how it should look like if you want it to be very complete and shared with the whole team. Uh, now, if we're talking, um, let's see, uh, in tab that I've opened. Alina, no? Okay, uh, no, I can see that uh, there was some glitch. Okay, um, so here's, for example, another one. So this is uh, Roadmonk. Roadmonk is great for anyone who wants to create any kind of a roadmap from beginners to uh, the professionals. Even the templates that they have, they're just amazing. So even here uh, we have, this is a clear example of an agile roadmap. And not only you can see like all the features that uh, we normally would introduce, but you can also change the view from agile-ish to a sprint view or a timeline view. So we're going to base on the agile view for now. So as you can see, again, we have uh, different separations by the team. So we have the infrastructure, we have new features. So stickiness, uh, integrations, and all of it is divided by the quarters. So we have some people who would be like responsible for demo staging. Um, some people who are responsible for front end prototype, so unless, again, uh, so here in the jar, we just have uh, this certain task in one quarter. And then normally in the end of this task, what would happen is that there would be a review of what we did. And we're trying to figure out what are the uh, weak parts of what we did, what are the strong sides. So we're trying to remove all the probable obstacles or the problems that we might have had when we were developing the solution so we can uh, succeed and move forward to quarter two and to make something even better from what we did before. So more or less, this is how a uh, agile roadmap would work, not only for software development, but it would work in general for any kind of a project. Now, um, I think that uh, for the question about Agile, that would be all that I would have to say. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for actually showing the examples. This is exactly what we also wanted to share with the audience because uh, on the way we got some questions from people like, okay, the theoretical parts and uh, explanations you gave during the workshop were just brilliant and clear. But then when they were coming to actually start building the roadmap, they got confused, they got stuck. 
So that, that, that's why we can maybe also go to some real life examples if that would be possible. But before that, uh, I actually come up with another question. So you were showing in Miro, you were showing the example of um, roadmap, the template. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were people that are assigned to particular um, parts and tasks of the project. And like from another point of view, it's also the way of building the structure or organizational structure of the company, right? Pretty much, yes. So uh, in general, uh, the okay. So the roadmap is just the tool that can help you to establish some kind of a norm when it comes to any kind of activity that needs uh, some, well, let's say tasks. So it can be just like, as I said, during the workshop, it can be not only just for products and projects. Some, uh, it can also be used for sales. Like you can use it to establish hierarchy in the sales department, who is responsible for what. It can be used for management, for organization, even for technological part, when you just have to identify which technology you have to use. So this is a very universal tool that everyone uses. Pretty much the roadmap itself, it started with uh, someone, just imagine, like, uh, not even imagine, just remember how you were, for example, studying at the university. Like, you have to have some kind of a project or even your thesis. You still have to outline your thesis. You, ha you have the introductory part, you have every other part. Technically, that is also a roadmap. So this is just, it tells you how you should follow. So you can go for introductory part until the final th thesis of your work. So, and you just outline it. So roadmap by itself, it just outlines the whole organizational part, not only of the project or product, but of the company itself. Mm -hmm. I see, awesome. Yeah, actually there were some questions about educational roadmap for personal and educational development during the study at the university. And I think that it should be kind of taught at the beginning of the first grade at the university, because I, I can remember myself when I entered the university, I could hardly imagine how and where I will finish it, how and where I will be after I graduate. So <laughs> I should have listened to such a workshop on that moment. I think it would really help me a lot. Well, to be honest, like if you, this kind of workshops, yes, it's true. I think this is something that has to be uh, towards uh, the universities as well, especially during the first year, because when you just start studying, you you don't know where it's going to lead you. Like I had absolutely no idea that at the moment that I finished the university, uh, well, actually, like going back from there, I never thought that I would be studying, for example, computational linguistics, because when I started university, I was studying international law, and then I decided to change, and there was no way in hell that I would actually know or expect that by the end of my university career i would be graduating not from one but from two universities and one of them would be the university of cambridge considering that i started studying in, in spain so uh and then like so this thing especially like when it comes to the education itself i think that it is very crucial for students and also for teachers to uh give a tool that will help the well the teenagers who just go to the university to manage their time and to actually find a way how to study. Especially if there is, for example, uh, an online education, like now during this uh, stage of the virus that is still like raging over the world, uh, there's a lot of issues with the online education because uh, people, like kids, they're trying to study, but they're not exactly uh, well adjusted to this system. So there are some university systems that are very much uh, going along with the self-education. So they have like classes once a week and the rest of the time you're just studying on your own. So you are basically used to making this kind of uh, roadmaps for yourself. This is pretty much the case of the University of Cambridge. This is how it works there. But at the same time, when you go to one of the European universities, like, uh, well, in my case, that was uh, the Complutense University of Madrid, there was a very strict policy that you have to attend all the classes every single day. So you were just stuck at the university for six hours, you were tired, and you are not used to doing something online on your own. So this like uh, this tool that can help you to be more uh, independent, I think that is actually a must have for all the universities. That's absolutely true. Um, another question has been up in my mind. Uh, how about freelancers? They are joining various projects at the same time 
and um, they should get like they should get used to various modes of managing or planning the project should they come up with some kind of a roadmap for themselves in the professional and personal uh, terms when they are entering the new project or it actually depends on the project itself if it's like a big company and it really has like a normal normally established uh, management or if it's just a small project they just don't need actually care about it and just do it finish and go further how do you think okay so um I do tend to work with uh, different projects at the same time because uh, as part of uh, LN Research Group, we have uh, this uh, new track that we started this year. Well, we used to do it before just a little bit, and now it's uh, a huge one. We are helping startups uh, and young companies that are not, they don't want to be considered a startup but to develop their positions in the world, especially like new positions in the market. So sometimes I get to work with different uh, companies at the same time. What I find very helpful is that you actually do develop some kind of a personal roadmap so it can actually look something like the agile roadmap but instead of so when we have this vertical where we write down the different teams and what they're responsible for you can just same uh, line out all the companies all the projects that you work for and there then horizontally you just line out all the um, all the tasks that you have when you have the visual representation of what you're working on, it's much easier to track it than to actually keep it just in mind and really hoping that you would be relying on your memory and it would not, never fail you. This happens like a lot. So uh, I tried being very independent with uh, just my memories. It never works. So this is why even now, uh, not only I have like a lot of digital ways to uh, and graphical ways to remind me about everything that I have to do. I also have like a lot of notebooks that are like just laying around and I just I prefer to write down things and just ideas and it helps. So yes, developing a roadmap for yourself, it is very important and it is crucial if, if you, especially if you have a lot of different projects going on. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you, because I saw that we had actually freelancers in our attendee list, so I'm sure it will be valuable to them to hear. Uh, another question I got here that's also in relation to some of my projects maybe, and I'm sure it will be useful for others to hear as well. Um, so you, you have built up the roadmap, you have presented it to the team, or you actually build it up with the team, like together with the team. And if the team is not yet highly experienced and they just get these um, bigger tasks for them uh, these tasks are assigned to each of the team members and then at some point they are not very sure how to actually deal with these tasks does that mean that we need to write down everything every possible detail about each task and does it mean that uh, like what, what's actually better to for manager for business owner or who is actually the uh, like the initiator of this pro process, is it better to this initiator to uh, break down the bigger tasks into smaller tasks and just, uh, you know, give it to, to the team members? Or is it better to really just tell to the team that, okay, here is something under your responsibility, you are the project owner or the task owner, now please go and plan the, um, implementation of this task by yourself and then just meet with them meet with them i don't know in a week or in two weeks and see how it is going but it, it can be if it's just you know starting out or if you are not very dependent on your partners and customers etc but if you have strict deadlines and you cannot really be flexible with that how do you think like how it's better to organize this process in the terms of management and dealing with all these tasks mm -hmm. so um as much as i don't like the words like agile and waterfall uh, i just think that they've been used way too, too way too much in the last year in every single stage and every single area of it um it is true that agile uh, roadmaps for example they are the most uh, well used and they're actually the most efficient and uh, this is one of the risks that they have in their maps and that is actually applicable to all the roadmaps in general and that's about that uh, if the team decides 
that the task is, task is actually cumbersome and you cannot uh, just divide this, you cannot take it all by yourself and you have to divide it in different parts. These little parts, they may take much more time to finally finish the project that you have and to successfully uh, enter the market at the time that you, well, established for yourself. So you might be missing the deadline. So um, I think that uh, for the business owners and for the uh, team leads and everyone who's in charge of developing the roadmap, even if they think that they don't have enough experienced people on the team, it is important to assess the possibilities and also talk about it with the, the people you're planning to assess the task to. So uh, you have to make sure that not only the test is viable, that it's not something crazy that you're going to be asking people of, but you have to also make sure that these people won't be just telling you that, yeah, I can do that. And then in two weeks, you see that they can't. So you're two weeks behind on the progress. So again, having this like uh, the golden middle, finding this like, you know, common ground between how big the task should be it should be exactly like you know this is like the most the hardest part uh especially if there's only one person working on this task obviously if you can see that you need to um put a weight of an enormous task on the shoulders of one person it's better to make that two people that have been taking down this task but i would say and i would suggest strongly suggest to never keep uh tasks too small or too big they should be easy to, to manage. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you also talked during the workshop about the moments when uh, you, like you have milestones or you just have some sessions when you get together with your team and you make a revision of what they have achieved, what they have completed uh so how it's better to organize such meetings in like how long they should be what should be uh discussed on them and what should be under the biggest focus uh because like i can recall some uh, suggestions from you know scrum meetings again your favorite agile and so on i mean there are different uh, types of meetings for the team to revise their work but from from your experience and from your perspective how is better to actually uh, organize it and how it's better to make the team uh, be actually interested in this meeting so that I don't know, maybe they should be able to show off during these meetings, yeah, and get their moment of fame or something like that. So uh, I would say that if you have a certain milestones, like, um, okay, let's focus on my favorite agile roadmaps uh, on this uh, little feedback session and use it as an example. So um, considering that agile itself, like the roadmap consists of the quarterly milestones, I would say that uh, the ideal time for like for meetups to discuss the project and the progress would be about every two weeks. Um, why? Uh, two weeks are normally enough to not only assess the task that you have to do, but also to start doing it and show the first results. And this is like a common ground for those who don't want to spend way too much time on something that it might be failing, or it will be just enough time, like, you know, for to concern and to address all the concerns. So uh, normally if it's uh, a big team, let's say that you have uh, 20 people on your team that are involved in this roadmap. So these 20 people would be like divided by uh, smaller teams. Um, I'd say that if you don't want to actually like you know turn it into something crazy that people would be talking about all the time and interrupting each other you should keep it small so it should be one representative from the team that collects all the information about the, the work and then you just go on the call especially if you're working online it's easier you just go on the call and it's about 
in our experience, it's about one hour, uh, one hour and a half tops, when um, the project manager, for example, uh, is addressing all your concerns and asking you questions about your progress. And then you actually have an opportunity to discuss and to suggest something new or resolve any questions that you might have. So this is probably the most interesting, well, the easiest part to do it. And uh, if you want to interest someone in participating, uh, I think you should be like more worried about it when you accept this person for a job, because if you actually work with someone who is not interested in your project, that would be a fail from the very beginning. Uh, so let's assume that everyone who is on your project now is very interested in everything you say. So, um, and it's also important to actually uh, have this possible uh, cross-functional communication. Like you should let people talk to each other freely so if they have some questions, you also have, I think you should have the transparency. So uh, any employee can go to any other colleague or even to the uh, representative of the management easily without just jumping through the hoops to get their attention. And I think that's important uh, and it can actually help you a lot in developing of the successful product. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, you are absolutely right with the point of hiring the right people but sometimes i mean when the project goes for a long time uh some of the team members are getting kind of burned out or pseudo burned out and then it's becoming harder and harder to get them on the meetings and to make them really be present on them and the, the, this was actually also the part of this question yeah because from the beginning everyone is interested everyone is impressed everyone wants to show off etc but when it comes to a, a year a year and a half it's becoming harder and harder to make them all turn on during these meetings and um also what do you think about the stand-up actually stand-ups like everyday stand-ups because in touch team we practice every morning stand-ups and we find it quite interactive and interesting because everyone stays on the top of all the information what's going on in the company what are the news what are the updates where are moving next or if there are any changes needed and also there is a room for them for, for the team members to actually ask the questions uh and don't wait with them for later mm -hmm. okay um so obviously well regarding the burning out uh this is why it is uh, what i said on the workshop and this is what i'm going to be pushing forward all the time you should be able and you should not be afraid of taking a look back at what you have done in order to move forward more successfully because the task itself it might be similar but it always you're going to be facing different problems like you can have uh, different bugs that you have to solve in your code or you might have a new team member who you have to couch. So uh, there's always something changing. So you have to like introduce these changes so they're interesting for everyone. And regarding the stand-ups, uh, well, uh, on, even on the example of our and research group, we don't really do that things, but we do have a chat where we are all integrated. So not only like in different uh, media. So we have our own Skype chat, we have Telegram, we have, we're using Slack, anything. So, uh, and on this chat, we're normally, we're just exchanging the news. Uh, we have the call-ins about every two, three days, uh, but mostly, it's also mostly by the teams. When we're talking about the general one, when all the company has to be involved, it's a very rare situation when we have to do that. We're just trying to keep everything more or less uh, separated but if there is something that we really have to discuss we have a general chat where we can all ask some questions because you know we just uh, all the people are different some people prefer to be very um, very much on their introvert side and they don't like you know interacting and accepting and adjusting to all the social norms of being in contact with everyone all the time and then they're very chatty people that you know they need some attention from you all the time and we have both types of them and we realize that having an opportunity for, uh, for giving them the option of talking it out and giving them the option of sitting out also on that matter is the best one. So I would say that I think that chat is the best option for communicating through in the company. Um, what do you think better, chat in Slack or chat in Messenger or Telegram? I mean, like, oh, more I... official channel or more unofficial one? 
I'd say a more unofficial one that gives you more liberty to you to express yourself using some kind of a gifts or like this emojis or something else. Okay, perfect. We are out of the time. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Catherine. She's always open. I know that and always ready to help. Uh, for now, thank you a lot, Catherine, for helping us. Please oh, do very, share. One last thing uh, that we yeah. want, I wanted to say, and it's, I think, very important that um, since we're very happy that we got to participate in Touch again, we are ready to take, well, I'm personally ready to take three startups of your selection on uh, the small, let's call it a crash course on developing your marketing strategy and roadmap. So you can enter either new markets or, well, solve any problem that you have. So it will be first come, first serve basis. So if anyone is interested, I'd be more than happy to help you with your well business development, uh, sales or marketing strategies. That is amazing. I'm sure we have some right here listening to you. <laughs> so we will put you in contact for sure. Thank you a lot for all the efforts and all the help. Um, next, I uh, welcome you, Catherine, too, to join our masterclass of healthy dinner cooking with gastronauts. It will be right now after our chat. Join us and see you later at the networking and virtual after party. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. See you. Bye. Bye.